Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, really uh, uh, very strong congratulations to Thermo Fisher, LifeTech, ABI, whatever they're called, um, uh, for launching a, a very good uh, symposium, excellent uh, set of presentations. So I'm quite pleased to be here. I need to figure out how to do this. It's um, this one? No, that's the pointer. Okay. Point. Okay, yeah. So we have a little photo montage here that uh, I put together to remind us of the uh, extremely wide scope and, and um, heavy impact that uh, missing persons issues have on society. So these, th these are events that come to our consciousness on a nearly daily basis. And there are commonalities with regard to the issues posed by missing persons, whether that be people missing from armed conflict, previous conflicts, ongoing uh, uh, conflicts, uh, routine missing persons cases, children that have become missing, transportation accidents, acts of terrorism, natural disasters, uh, all these kind of things. Human trafficking is another area where uh, uh, missing persons is uh, extremely uh, uh, poignant impact upon society. So as I go through a discussion today on the, the potential of uh, forensic genetics in missing persons, I'm going to take kind of a, a high altitude view. It's not going to be a very technical talk, but I'm going to try to place uh, developments of forensic genetics into the context and define uh, what needs to come together in order for, for successful uh, uh, resolution. Okay, so just, just focusing on, on forensic type technical aspects uh, of what's needed, uh, a, a DNA is just a small part of this. So all these pieces need to work together. So we have, first of all, discovery of the, uh, of, of the missing persons. And there's all kinds of evidence out there. We need information systems. Uh, registration of who's missing, a very important aspect of social media. You have to engage society in order to, uh, in order to register this information. Uh, things like remote imaging, geophysics to discover graves, physical probing, reconnaissance, those kind of things. Once, uh, once bodies are determined, uh, we have to employ forensic techniques, scene of crime documentation. Many times if it's a mass grave, we need um, highly skilled forensic archaeological techniques to make sure that the evidence is retained and the bodies are recovered intact as much as possible so as not to uh, confound the further work. Uh, so we need all kinds of specialized capabilities in terms of search and recovery, et cetera. Finally, there are many D, uh, types of identifiers in addition to DNA. Uh, I will be a, a strong champion for uh, the great strength that DNA brings to the process, but we have all these different areas that need to be covered. Uh, pathology, uh, regular digital fingerprints, uh, dental medical uh, comparisons, physical anthropology in the case of skeletal remains, etc. And then moreover, systems for uh, collection and databasing of anti-mortem data on the missing. So all these things need to come together. And at the end also, we have the very important element that the, a lot of this is private information from highly vulnerable populations, and we have a requirement to protect sensitive data. Okay, so those are just a brief outline of some of the forensic and or technical aspects of it, but indeed there are other components that, uh, that are also extremely important. Um, in many of the incidents involving missing persons, a response uh, is or should be conducted in a rule of raw law kind of framework. So in the end, responsibility for identifying and clarifying the, the fate of the missing should be a responsibility of states in a structured uh, rule of law framework. Uh, we also uh, intersect with criminal prosecution in many instances, terrorism, for example, uh, where uh, the goals of identification and the goals of prosecution uh, very often overlap. And this is particularly true in, in uh, war crimes tribunals and human rights violations, uh, where, uh, where we have, uh, uh, in addition, the right to know the truth of the loved ones, you have the right for justice through effective investigation. And all these things require that forensics be done correctly uh, in, in a highly systematic manner. So the science that we uh, try to apply uh, doesn't act in a vacuum, and we always have uh, specific contexts that, that create challenges. And moreover, there are additional requirements that need to be met. So 
we need to have, in terms of state response or international responses, predetermined roles and responsibilities. A medical legal authority system. Uh, very often, different government ministries are involved in different aspects of the, uh, of the undertaking. There can be law enforcement, uh, a wide range of emergency responses responders, and then uh, the, uh, the oversight of international mechanisms such as criminal tribunals or uh, the International Police Organization, Interpol, as an example. And then this needs to take place in a social setting. So there needs to be public involvement and outreach that involves effective communi communication. Uh, the family members need to trust the system and understand the system so that they can participate in the way that's necessary for providing information and, in the case of forensic genetics, family reference samples for comparison. So really, um, more than the technical capacity in a DNA laboratory, these issues often are the critical barriers to the potential of forensic genetics for identification. Um, and I just want to, uh, you know, it, it happens time and time again uh, that a, company, a country will come forward with a desire to uh, meet its responsibilities with missing persons, and their focus is on making a DNA laboratory. There's some concept that if you get a room and a number of trained scientists and put a bunch of wonderful Thermo Fisher instrumentation in there, that you've somehow taken the main step needed to deal with this. And that's not the case at all. All these components need to come together, and it's a highly intricate process. Let me talk just a little bit about um, why we identify. Uh, what, what is the status of our global situation that makes us want to identify people or feel that we need to identify people? So there, there are a number of rationales. Uh, it's becoming recognized that affected populations are entitled to, uh, to the right to know of what, what happened to their loved ones, so the, the ending of uncertainty, uh, and also the right to commemorate uh, steps toward psychological uh, healing and, and closure. Um, I, I mentioned before justice, the right to rest, restoration and retribution within a legal criminalistic system for, for perpetrators. And indeed, uh, a larger uh, concept of, of simply restoring public order. We have a situation where people have rights. There are rights to rights. So we go beyond just some humanitarian notion of, of turning one body over to one family and start to think about uh, uh, what humankind thinks are basic human rights and how these activities map onto that. Point. Okay, let me just, uh, I'm just going to go very briefly, I hope, through a number of some of the emerging mechanisms here. We have the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, that, that has put forward a, 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 a resolution that the international community must endeavor to recognize the rights of victims of gross violations of human rights and their families and society as a whole to know the truth to the fullest extent pr practicable. And this is also underscored by the International Convention for the Protection of Persons from Enforced Disappearance, another UN uh, 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 document that underscores the right to truth. Um, another mechanism is the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. We have a number of highly relevant articles, Article 2, Right to Life, Right Not to be Tortured, the Right to Liberty and Security. And uh, if, we, if we take a big view and consider the uh, impact of missing persons on society, we can see that, that many of these are involved. And in fact, the European Court of Human Rights has, uh, has ruled that the lack of a, an effective investigation into the fate of the missing is a formal violation of Articles uh, 2 and 3 of these with regard to families actually being tortured by the, the loss of their, of their loved ones. And there's a, there's a recognition that forensic DNA is becoming an essential tool for meeting this responsibility. Um, this is codified in a United Nations uh, General Assembly resolution that has a bunch of words here that I will paraphrase as soon as this works. Whoops, now he's gone one too far. Uh, that uh, DNA is an essential tool. They, uh, with regard to the fundamental characteristic of the right to know, uh, there, is a, there is a standing requirement for identification, and, and in the process of doing that, there's a requirement for data protection. 
And uh, now we have another United Nations human rights resolution on specifically relating to forensic genetics and human rights, recognizing the role that forensic genetics can play when properly applied, and again, emphasizing the critical need for uh, data protection, confidentiality, and restricted access. And this, is an, this last thing is an area that, uh, that I, I think needs as much championing as possible and one that is, I think, very poorly attended to by the efforts that have been put forward to date. Most laboratories have sort of general policies on data protection, et cetera, but when we get into international events, uh, it's approached as an ad hoc, in an ad hoc manner, or often not at all, but these are critical elements, and I just, I put some rather shocking slides up here to try to drive home, and this is just a narrow cross-section of the issue, but we have uh, incidental findings with regard to family relationships. We deal with family data. We have devastated families that provide their information, provide their genetic samples, and it turns out in many instances that there's information that's highly sensitive and can endanger these people. We have this, uh, this poor woman in the lower left is about to be stoned to death for adultery. And uh, many times these kind of events happen in countries with, uh, with deficient human rights records and or non, uh, you know, governmental authorities that, that, uh, that, that may be corrupt or, uh, and, and, and not uh, fit custodians of this type of sensitive data. So we need to pay a lot of attention and we need real mechanisms. Uh, in, the, in the context of, of defining what the responsibilities of, of the member states of the world are for, uh, for victim identification, we have a new thing that's, that's come up, and that is a, a, a declaration that the ICMP has, has developed. It's a declaration on the role of the state in addressing the issue of missing, persons missing as a consequence of armed conflict and human rights abuses. And uh, the, the initial signatories to this at the heads of state level have been all the countries of the former Yugoslavia. So we're, we're, we're very pleased and proud that, uh, that this, this, uh, uh, this uh, document that, that specifies many of these important aspects has now been taken on as fundamental responsibilities of the state. And we look forward to a wide participation in this declaration by many of the uh, states that have already expressed interest in doing so. So I've tried to get a little bit of sketch of sort of the general context in which these things go forward. And what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about my own organization and uh, try to show how, uh, how these things have come together in what is, in fact, the uh, world's largest and most successful human identification process. The ICMP uh, got established in 1996 in response to the uh, uh, extreme situation caused by missing persons in the former Yugoslavia from the context, conflicts in the 1990s. Some 35,000 people were missing, uh, uh, mostly in mass graves associated with, uh, with uh, well-publicized uh, ethnic cleansing. Um, the, the mission of the ICMP is, has, has a couple attributes, but one, it, it's not primarily a forensic organization. Our job is to ensure the cooperation of governments and others in addressing the issues of missing persons at all the different levels that I've referred, that I've referred to, to, to help build institutional capacity, encourage public involvement, and, and um, address justice. And part of that is to provide technical assistance in, in the identification process. Um, kind of frame, this is, this is a little, one case example that we've been working on in the former Yugoslavia that kind of uh, I'm going to use as a microcosm, and it has to do with uh, the, uh, the largest mass killing event in Europe since World War II that has been now ruled as a genocidal event by a number of criminal uh, tribunals of the ICTY. The UN safe area Srebrenica was established in 1993 for Bosnian Muslim refugees uh, they had they'd come together in the tens of thousands uh, being driven through ethnic cleansing to that area. And the United Nations ruled these as a, this is a safe area. Uh, and unfortunately, in 1995, uh, the, uh, the, the very poorly supported uh, little, little force there in, in Srebrenica failed to defend the enclave, and it fell to Bosnian Serb forces in July of 1995. We have in the, uh, the lower right here, uh, Ratko Mladic <clears throat> proudly entering the, uh, the environs of Srebrenica as his tanks roll through. Um, 
uh, one of the elements of this event was just in that very same time vicinity, uh, the, the, the population became panicked and they were quite afraid of the fate that in fact did uh, befall them. And a column of some 10 to 15,000 men made a desperate overland escape attempt across mountains and forests uh, to, to, to get to across the, the lines. But they were intercepted in route and attacked by heavy weaponry, heavy weaponry, et cetera. And uh, many, many were killed, but thousands of this column surrendered and were taken prisoner. Simultaneously, those who did not uh, uh, attempt the, the, um, the exodus uh, stayed behind in a place called Potichari. And uh, after the Serb forces uh, came in, Bosnian Serb forces, they separated the men, women and children and made a show of, of, of busing them across lines to, to safety, but in fact segregated the men and boys. And uh, it turns out that both, uh, both these people that had been segregated and all the people that were taken uh, prisoner through the uh, overland escape route were summarily executed at a number of spots, uh, usually by uh, simple um, uh, uh, rifle fire. And we have, uh, we now know, this, is, this has all been extremely investigated. We have five of the, of the very large primary execution and grave sites with the order of a, a thousand people uh, being uh, executed and buried there at the same time. This, uh, this became known by the international community through a number of ways. Uh, pro uh, very prominent was uh, aerial imagery. So we have in the, the upper left here uh, the uh, uh, aerial spy plane imagery of the uh, formation of a primary mass grave happening over that time period. And then what happened uh, after, after the story began to be in the press, Madeleine Albright holding these images up, et cetera, the, uh, the perpetrators of the, of the event went back in some months later and dug up the, the primary graves and took the bodies, and now body parts, to a whole series of distant secondary mass graves spread throughout eastern Bosnia. And so on the, on the right here we have in, now in October 1995 the formation of a bunch of secondary mass graves in an attempt to, uh, to, to hide the, uh, the bodies and, and the crime. So as a result of this fragmentation and commingling, uh, some of the excavation, excavations, exhumations of the remains gave rise to these horribly jumbled patterns of skeletons. And you can uh, begin to imagine the, the, the scale of the forensic problem here when you consider that there are 8,000 people potentially in, involved in this. They weren't all as, as bad as this, but in, indeed most were fragmented into to some type, uh, to some sub-body parts, et cetera. Well, at the time that, the, that this, these investigations went forward, and they were spearheaded originally by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia that came in to document the war crimes, they actually had no provision for identification, and that became turned over to the ICMP. And the traditional model at the time was to use as many different lines of evidence as possible. DNA had only been uh, used a little bit in these type of, uh, of, of studies. So we have clothing and personal effects being documented, and we cooperated with the International Committee of the Red Cross to put together books, and the families would come in and look at them uh, and try to identify uh, their loved ones. But So how well did that work? Uh, here's just a little, uh, one particular example. We, the, this book was shown uh, to families of clothing and personal effects of 800 discrete cases from Srebrenica. And families identified in 281 instances uh, that, that they thought these are the, the effects of their loved ones. But it's immediately obvious that there's some problems here because there are 72 instances where different families identified the same set of effects. Um, when finally the anthropology and pathology were brought into it, uh, there were only 56 of these 281 cases that were even possible identifications. But subsequently when DNA testing occurred, uh, only half of those uh, were, were correct. So in the end, we have 25 uh, identifications out of 281 family identifications. So we have a, about a 10% chance of the families being correct, that that's who these remains belong to. So progress is not, uh, is not uh, happening rapidly. So faced with these kind of things, and what we have here is an, an absolute dearth of systematically available medical and dental records, uh, very uh, no fingerprint records, refugee populations. I mean, these are all the reasons why that the traditional approach works so badly. But the idea was that, uh, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna try a DNA-led approach. And this was a new concept at the time, but it's simple in terms of today's logic. 
We uh, have a database of family members of the missing at a regional scale, and then we have high throughput testing of the uh, skeletal remains samples with computerized DNA matching. So in the end, our first line of evidence with regard to the identity comes from highly statistically significant DNA match reports. Um, obviously, that's not a simple thing to do, and it required the development of highly optimized capabilities in, in getting DNA from very, very difficult skeletal remains. It was, at that time, almost exclusively a mitochondrial DNA undertaking. Uh, the ability to deal with complex uh, genetic kinship analysis with the, with the families, quality assurance and workflow, and then a hugely important aspect of databases and informatics to, to bring all this information together and make the matching. Um, okay, so uh, this, is, uh, this is just a snapshot of, uh, of how well this worked. You see the years up to 2001 where the sort of traditional approaches were tried with DNA on a um, hypothesis by hypothesis basis, and then in 2002 the adoption of this DNA-led approach, and these are the identifications specifically from Srebrenica. The total number of identifications to date from Srebrenica is uh, almost 7,000 of the 8,000 individuals that were killed at that time, so it's been a very successful program. Now, the uh, Srebrenica event was, was only one of the many things that had been, we'd been involved in, in not only Bosnia, but also Kosovo, uh, and to a lesser extent, Serbia and Croatia. Uh, overall, today, here's, here's where we are. We have a, a family reference database of STR profiles of over 90,000 individuals representing 30,000 or so missing persons. We've uh, got DNA profiles from uh, 41,000 bones representing 21,000 uh, unique individuals and almost 18,000 uh, uh, DNA identifications. So the, the, the result of that work plus uh, other, other identification efforts that had been done previously has resulted in over 70% of the 35,000 people missing from the conflict to, to, uh, to have been identified to date. I better speed things up a little bit. Um, I'm just going to... Um, I want to talk about here a little bit. This is an example of how DNA uh, adds to uh, higher order linkages between the secondary graves. Uh, the previous slide showed a skeleton that was identified out of 12 different body parts from four different secondary graves, sometimes uh, at, at great distances. And we have here linkages between the designated secondary mass graves. And every time there's a green dot between is when we have the same body part uh, identified, uh, or uh, a different body part from the same uh, individual identified. And we can actually put together a, a pattern of activity here with regard to the uh, criminal enterprise of trying to uh, um, uh, cover up this, uh, this crime. So a lot of this work has been uh, very important in some very high profile prosecutions at the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, DNA case files, excavation reports, ex expert testimony. Uh, we have uh, some 15,000 DNA match reports in evidence and uh, on the left is uh, Radovan Karadzic, the president of the Bosnian Serb Republic, and then on the right is Radovan Karadzic, the, uh, the general who uh, ordered the execution of the men from Srebrenica. But this, uh, our participation in this process, again, points out the, the challenge of the data protection mechanisms. So while there's a requirement in criminal proceedings to provide evidence uh, uh, to both parties of the justice system, uh, we have a situation where the family members gave us their, 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 their data, and you know, it's, it's safe to say that some of them might not want their genetic data turned over to the, the very individual that killed their family members in, in terms of their defense system. So uh, we have uh, diplomatic privileges and immunities in our, in our headquarters in Bosnia, and it allowed us to hold this, uh, hold this data uh, uh, securely, negotiate with the course, uh, courts, and provide, uh, provide uh, representative genetic data only under specific consent from the families. And so we work very closely with the ICTY successfully. So um, this is what the forensic science department that I oversee looks like. We have archaeology and anthropology, uh, a DNA identification coordination division that, that, that handles all the data and performs the DNA matching. Uh, also takes in the samples, uh, et cetera, DNA laboratories, and then we have a, a very strong team of database programmers. I'll talk a little bit more about them. 
Now, in going through this, this set of slides, I want to emphasize again the different pieces that need to be in place just technically in order for this success to happen. So remember, we can't think about just a shiny DNA lab. It has to function in this environment. So these are um, uh, bodies recovered by various organizations through excavations over the years. So many thousands of, uh, of excavations throughout the region. You have to be able to discover the grave, and we have witness information and a variety of other methods to do that. Um, and then you need proper scene of crime documentation. Um, uh, again, further, further to that is very rigorous uh, uh, documentation in the excavation and the application of a high degree of expertise in making sure that you don't just jumble all the remains up and, uh, and miss the, uh, uh, miss the uh, documentation for evidence purposes. We do uh, use three-dimensional total station mapping sometimes, and this is able to really tell the story of, of what went on here. We can separate in different deposits as the trucks dump the people into these graves and show how they were, how they were established. Uh, then um, anthropology uh, is where the DNA sampling comes in, but moreover, uh, age, sex, and stature kind of determination. And then very, very important element is the public involvement. So we couldn't do any of this if we didn't have uh, the participating family members uh, providing uh, reference samples. And to, to do this, we had very uh, aggressive information campaigns. We also have funded fam family organizations and helped them pressure the government uh, and, and drive all this thing forward uh, at, at the uh, societal level. Um, family reference sample uh, collection. I really don't want to go into the details. And then with regard to the DNA lab, I'm not going to go into the details there either. We're performing uh, uh, nuclear autosomal STR testing according to ISO accredited standards in a modular high throughput environment that enabled us uh, at our maximum rate to do uh, over 100 bone samples a day. Uh, and when I said modular, we have specific teams that, that run in an assembly line fashion through all the different, the different elements. So a highly optimized workflow. It's very critical in order to lower the costs. Um, uh, highly effective uh, DNA uh, extraction techniques for bone based on delimeralization. That's all been published. And our, our primary databases have simply been, starting many years ago, with a ProMega PowerPlex 16 system. Uh, we, we did not uh, do mitochondrial DNA. It's vastly expensive for this type of an undertaking. But we do now have a lot of different uh, uh, STR kits, y filer uh, validated that can increase the statistics in, in, in difficult cases and also to include the ability to turn to mtDNA. So these are all value-added ways to solve cases, whereas the majority of the cases are solved just from the PP16 system. We have our own DNA matching uh, capability, and this is a, a, huge, uh, a hugely complex undertaking and one of the most important things that is very often lacking in the DNA laboratory, uh, in the DNA identification system. So we have our own system that, that conducts pairwise comparisons and spits back ranked lists of uh, relationship indices. And these are nicely integrated into our missing persons database so we can pull everybody together uh, very easily. We actually use uh, Charles Brenner's program, DNA View, for our final kinship reporting uh, presently. And then issue DNA match reports of very high statistical strength. The ICMP is not an identification authority, so we provide assistance to the court-appointed pathologists, and they're able to turn to those DNA match reports. Talk a little bit about the identification management system that we've developed. It's, it's comprehensive, uh, covering all the different fields, archaeology, anthropology, uh, DNA, etc. One of the things that we have is uh, that's a component of this is an online inquiry tool, and this is an interface between uh, the ICMP and external bodies. Uh, with regard to missing persons, the public can register missing persons with us and also track the status of their of their case, whether sufficient reference samples have been uh, acquired to uh, to enable the identification of their loved one, and whether uh, any information has been passed to the domestic authorities with regard to the case. In other words, has ICMP issued a DNA match report? Sometimes we're not the bottleneck, most of the time we're not the bottleneck, but there are other steps outside of our control that we communicate with the public. Moreover, different organizations uh, uh, that, that uh, send samples to the ICMP can follow the photo documentation, follow the progress of the case through this. 
Now, currently, we're redesigning the entire system, so it's a standalone web-operated system, so that uh, these care capabilities will be accessible to anybody that we give access privileges to around the world. And this will be very helpful for disaster victim identification um, uh, to, to allow DNA matching capability, et cetera. We've been involved in a large number of different uh, instances around the world uh, where we, uh, we try to, to bring all these elements together and assist. We, we've played different roles in different places. Uh, a couple of the areas where we've had extremely ambitious uh, long-term programs is Iraq and to a little bit lesser extent, Libya. So we've, we've trained uh, scores and scores of people in all the different aspects and provided DNA uh, uh, results and DNA match reports, helped with capacity building there. Uh, and, uh, but it serves to underscore just how challenging it is to do this. Um, and, and now, unfortunately, the security system, situation in both of those two countries has basically taken everything back down to, to rock bottom. Uh, but again, you know, these, are, these are places that want to build DNA labs, and you have to go in from the outset and say, you've got a lot more to do than just build a lab. Sorry, I have to see where I am here. Um, so making note to uh, those challenges, let's, let's pass on to, to some of the other areas where, where there's fundamental challenges. As you know, with economic migration and across the Mediterranean, many instances in the news of, of displaced persons uh, uh, being lost at sea, uh, we have cross-border problems here. So these are, the people are dead in places not of their origin. Um, uh, and then in, in the United States, also uh, the cross-border situation there, we have a, an inability to deal with these situations. Uh, we, uh, the, there's the interface with law enforcement that many of the, uh, 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 of the affected families are, are, are afraid to deal with. And moreover, there, aren't, uh, there isn't a mechanism to get these profiles into, for example, the US National Missing Persons Database. So we need additional international mechanisms to deal with this. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to propose that there is, a, there is a, a kind of a new tool that we can uh, apply to this, and that's a treaty-level international organization exclusively dedicated to addressing all these issues of the missing persons. Well, that, that is us. It's the ICMP, but I'm calling it version two. Uh, but uh, in a recent signing ceremony in Brussels, uh, we, we have been given a new international charter with uh, uh, a whole set of uh, legal um, immunities and capabilities that are internationally recognized. And we hope to be able to, to take these things that we've, we've developed and, and move them forward. You guys, if I get in, you just cut me off when? Um, so what do we want to do with this? So we're going to continue with the very types of, of activities that I just described, but I, I want to highlight a number of things that we really want to take forward because I think they're the most important uh, missing elements. First of all is missing persons database resources. We have to collect information. Let's consider Syria, for example. We have thousands of people being killed there. How do we collect that information? How do we register it? Um, we want to work also to, to, uh, um, to eliminate these uh, institutional barriers to work. So cooperative agreements are already in place with Interpol, primarily for disaster victim identification, the UN or International Organization for Migration, et cetera. Uh, and also with regard to database interoperability, there are many databases out there that, that can't talk to each other, either for technical reasons or for, for legal reasons. But with regard to uh, an international non-governmental and non-law enforcement uh, status, perhaps we'll be able to bridge these gaps and hold data securely while talking to these other groups that, uh, that otherwise can't talk to each other. Technical development focused uh, intently on the missing with an emphasis on um, uh, MPS, massively parallel sequencing, and a global forum to help drive all these, these elements together from the standpoint of policy, policy um, and practice. Technical training, capacity building, institutional development, governmental structures will be, will be strong emphases. Just one more second. Um, I'm not going to read this slide in detail, perhaps you're, you're, you're fast readers, but M MPS and next generation sequencing is obviously where the field is going. And there are, there are ways that I think that this could be very carefully targeted to, for maximal success with regard to, uh, to, to missing persons specifically.
And this is, a, this is a, an event in, in my professional life that, was, that meant a lot to me. This is my last couple of slides. What you see there is a mass grave in Haiti being established uh, for the burial of the people. Um, the, 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 no attempt to identification whatsoever was made. And we've, we've heard earlier today how uh, the sequencing, cost of sequencing has gone down by something like five or six orders of magnitude. What can we do to, uh, to decrease the cost of, of human identification testing? There's got to be some way to do better as, if we push extremely hard. And I, again, I hate to show you this, uh, this, this really gripping slide, but we're if we're talking about a human rights framework, by definition, they apply to all. And I just want you to just think for a minute of if this arm belonged to somebody from the World Trade Center, from somebody from your country in a plane crash, et cetera, what, you know, what would the response be? Whereas the response for hundreds of thousands of people in this and many other events around the world are simply another shovel of dirt. What can we do as a community to solve that? Thank you.